Hello, my another guest today is Mark Parsons, Secretary General of Research Data Alliance, expert in data sharing networks and an innovation through data exchange. Welcome, Mark, and thank you for accepting our invitation. My pleasure. Um, let's start with Research Data Alliance. Could you please describe the major areas in which RDA is active and the key objectives that you want to reach as an institution? So Research Data Alliance is focused on data sharing. We want to make data sharing work better. Our mission statement is to build the social and technical bridges that enable the open sharing of data. And so by that we mean overcoming whatever little barriers there are to making data reusable is maybe another way of thinking about sharing. Um, data gains value through reuse beyond its original intent. And so what we're trying to do is develop the technologies, the practices, the, the, the social norms that enable open sharing of data. Open data has become one of the most discussed elements of the open science movement besides open access. Uh, what are the key features of open data? Is openness itself enough to make it work? No, of course not. Um, openness is just the first step. Um, I think when we're talking about openness, that's also defined in a variety of different ways. Um, in my mind, it should be the default for all research data and that you restrict access to data only under certain ethical circumstances. So it shouldn't be a proprietary issue, it should be an ethical issue. So data should be freely available um, within the bounds of ethical use. So you obviously privacy concerns or identification of the location of uh, endangered species, say, things like that. There are ethical reasons for not sharing data, but in general the default should be for, uh, for open. But just making the data open, putting it on a website, say, is only the beginning because what we, as I mentioned before, we really want to make the data reusable. And especially if you're coming from outside the discipline in which the data were created, you need documentation describing the data, describing the uncertainties around the data. Um, but ideally what you want is to be able to just suck the data straight into the, your analysis tool and compare it to other data that you have, um, integrate it with other data you have. And so that requires the data to be formatted in a standard way or at least in a way that your tools understand. It needs to have um, descriptions around it, that they, again, that the tools can understand so it knows what the units are, for example. Um, it requires particular protocols so that the data can be transferred smoothly. Um, and it, I think at a core, it requires a certain level of trust. So trust in the data itself, trust in the source of the data, trust in the storage of the data, trust in the persistence of the data, um, trust in the methods that created the data. Um, so I think there's, Openness is only the first step. Making open and reusable and workable is a much more complicated issue, and that's really what RDA is trying to focus on. So if the essence of open data is reusability, uh, what is crucial to provide it? Is it infrastructure, good preservation plan, legal changes, or maybe something else? All of the above. Um, if data are collected, they should be preserved. I think that's a fundamental issue. Um, it's not necessarily core to RDA's mission, but of course you can't reuse data if it's not preserved. I think governments have a particular obligation if they pay to collect data, they should probably pay to preserve the data. It should be viewed as a public good, so it's a public responsibility to maintain it. Um, but it also needs to be well documented, particularly the uncertainties of the data and where it's in, a, in appropriate and, and inappropriate use. Um, it requires adherence to good standards. Um, all those sorts of things. Open data is often seen together with another phenomenon of today, namely big data. And in fact, data sets generated nowadays can be enormous in terms of its volume. But is really volume the biggest challenge in this regard, or is it data heterogeneity? In my opinion, it's more the heterogeneity. Um, they talk in big, so big data is a buzzword. It's, it's a trendy thing right now. Um, I think that's good. I mean, it's, it's raising the attention of, of and getting focus on data, but it, particularly in industry, it's become, you know, just like I say, a buzzword. It's like, oh, we can handle big data. Um, and big is in the eye of the beholder. For some, you know, gigabytes is big. For others, it doesn't get big until we get to exabytes. Um, the ish, and so when we talk about big data, they talk often about the three Vs. Um, volume, velocity, and variety. Um, 
there's also additional Vs that have been added, but those are the original three. And so the volume is certainly a challenge. If it's too big to be able to move to a, a place for you to do your analysis and you have to move your analysis to the data, the velocity is certainly a change. A lot of data are streaming in as fa you know, faster than we can digest them, if you will. That's certainly going to be the case with um, high energy physics, things like that, where we're getting massive amounts of data, not just massive, but very quickly. But to me, the really difficult challenge is that last V, the variety, the heterogeneity, as you put it. And we see this um, particularly in what they call the long tail of data, where the data collected by individual researchers or particular or small um, teams of investigators. And so much of that data, in my experience, tends to be simple tabular data, maybe in Excel files or, or text files, um, but it's very higgledy-piggledy. Um, someone puts temperature in this column and, calls it and labels it T. Someone puts temperature in this column and labels it temp. Um, and this is air temperature and this is ground temperature. Um, and it's all very customized to the particular application of the particular researcher who is collecting that data. And to have some sort of consistency across that data so we can integrate it requires a lot of social change as well as technical change. I think dealing with volume and velocity is largely a technical problem. And yes, the, the, the volume of data is exceeding maybe our ability to um, analyze it, but I, I'm confident that technologically we will be able to keep up. This has always been a problem. We've always had more data than we've been able to, to, um, to digest, if you will. I've heard the quote now for several years that we've produced more data in the last five years than we produced in all the time before that. Um, that's probably true, but I wonder how long it has been true. I mean, it's probably been true since at least the 90s. Um, so I think technologically we'll keep up with the volume and the, and the velocity, but the variety requires a lot more significant change, not just from the technical standpoint, but all the way down to the researcher in the field and the practices that they're, they're implementing in collecting that data and presenting that data. Uh, we have already mentioned open access, and uh, I think that where is a scholarly paper uh, definitely makes up a concise unit you know, with its author, title, paragraphs, uh, notes, bibliography, etc. Data sets seem to be much more nebulous and without the proper context. Uh, data is floating in a void and it isn't very useful. What can scientists do to improve their data sets if, when they think about sharing them? Document them. Um, write down everything. Um, if in doubt, write it down. Um, so much, I think, is um, embedded in the sort of tacit knowledge of the person who originally collected the data or did the analysis, that there's certain assumptions that they just make that they assume everybody knows because it's just standard within their field. But when you talk about reuse outside of the field, they're not aware of those assumptions. Um, the packaging concept you mentioned, that's, that's really intriguing to me. Um, and I think, actually, we, we, we run into problems when we overextend the concept of data publication to be too much like article publication. I think it's better to think of data as an ongoing stream as opposed to discrete published units. And it's a very dynamic stream that's constantly changing. And so thinking about it more as a flow as opposed to an object might be a way to begin to sort of conceptualize ways to address that. Um, but from a researcher perspective, the best thing that they can do is just document as much as they did in, from the software to the, to the collection protocols, to the units, to the uncertainties, et cetera. Okay, so let's uh, talk about incentives now. How can researchers be encouraged to, to share data? What sort of incentives can we adopt to make them open their data? And is it possible to trace data citation using alternative metrics as we have started doing it in, in with scholarly articles? Yeah, I think so. Um, incentives are certainly key. Um, and there's been a lot of talk about data citation as, as an incentive. And I'm somewhat of a believer in that. I've been, a, I've been an advocate for data citation for, for decades. Um, and we figured out how to do it. We know how to cite data. Um, it, it's not done on a regular basis, but it should be. Um, and so 
getting then citations to your data, and for example, in Thomson Reuters, I think there's a talk going on right now, um, is creating a data citation index so we can track the citations of data. That's great, um, but right now, if you're going up for your tenure review, no one's going to be looking at your data citations. They're going to be looking at your high profile papers in high impact factor journals. In fact, I've had researchers say to me, I don't want a data citation because it dilutes citations to my paper. Um, I want them to cite, and ideally they should be citing both, paper and data, but um, there is that fear there. So I think citation is a component of it, um, and, but there's been, there been, there's been research out there, surveys that show that the impact that researchers are interested in is really around what they are rewarded on in, the, in, in their academic environment, and that's in those, those high impact papers. So if the data is associated with a high impact paper, it makes sense. They're less interested in data that might have a huge Im societal impact in terms of, say, you know, say it's a climate data set and it helps with agricultural prediction. That could have huge economic benefit, but they don't get rewarded for that in the same way. So we need to, I think, present um, incentives beyond citation um, in ways that are more meaningful to the researchers. And one is just to demonstrate the value, if they put their data in a repository, that the data can be more easily integrated with other data, more usable by themselves, more reusable. So if, if a repository can show actual value added when the data is brought in to the researchers themselves, I think that's, that's one, one step. The other thing is um, sharing data often leads to more collaborations or more insight. Um, one of my favorite quotes from a, from a former colleague of mine was um, a senior researcher working in the Arctic. He's like, I don't understand all this reluctance to data sharing. Every time I share data, I learn something. But what he meant is the way he's sharing data and the way data is often shared is on a one-to-one -one personal sort of thing. Someone asks him for his data and he gives it to them and he finds out what they're doing with it. So I think a key thing is if we can make it more transparent about how data are being reused, that one, it'll, under, it'll um, lessen the fear of being scooped, which I think is somewhat of a red herring in the first place. Um, and two, it'll open people's eyes to how their data have applications that they hadn't anticipated and it will open them up to new collaborations, new insights, and so forth. So citation might be one way to do that, but I think a better way, and this requires more technical development, is if we, if we put persistent identifiers on the data, and then we should be able to track what happens to that data in a Google-like way. So we can see that data were used in this model, were used in, um, in this uh, prediction scenario, were used in, um, by the government in developing these policies, um, were used in, in a completely different discipline, um, was used in a medical application that wasn't published. So it's not just the publications that they can see, so we can see all the applications of the data, not just those in the scholarly, scholarly literature. And I think that's a trend we haven't seen yet in terms of how can we track where data are used throughout the entire ecosystem. And I, I, I think if we put persistent identifiers on data, that will enable that if, if, if that's open to the web in a way that can be crawled. Constant proliferation of, of new data demands thinking about the effective long-term preservation strategies. And how can we successfully plan for the future so that we could be sure that our infrastructure uh, is ready to absorb new data sets, uh, presumably much bigger, and to avoid formats obsolescence? That's a big question. I mean, um, there's lots that we need to do to ensure the preservation of data. I think fortunately, um, we know how to preserve data. We don't know exactly how to pay for it. Um, we don't have a really solid business model on, on data preservation. In my opinion, um, government funded data, i.e. publicly funded data, should be viewed as a public good and therefore there is a public interest in maintaining that data. Um, data should be seen by governments as a capital investment and so there needs to be then a capital maintenance budget. Um, that's, that's obvious and intuitive for, for physical capital. Um, when we're talking about this sort of capital, it's not so obvious and intuitive, but it should be. These data require some sort of level of preservation. 
format obsolescence, operating systems, and so forth. I'm not an expert in this, but we know how to deal with this. It's either through migration to new systems um, or emulating old systems. Um, when I used to work at a data center, um, when I first started there, we had just started our first media migration. We were moving from an old tape drive to what then was really cool um, write once, read many optical drive. And it was a big you know, media migration of, I don't know, a couple hundred gigabytes. And it was a big deal. And over time, that became an operational thing. It's just a regular thing that you have to do as a data center. You're, as soon as you're done with one migration, you're on to the next media migration. You know, that, that, that optical drive is long since gone. Um, we've gone through several migrations since then. So the professionals that do deal with data know how to do it. And they know how to preserve it. And there's there's and there's good there's a there's solid models on how to do it. The real issue is with the business model, and I think that actually requires more research. Mark, thank you very much for your time and this nice oh, conversation. That was it? Oh, okay.